100. Baby, thank you, Slim. It's good to see you. We want to thank you guys for your big heart and for loving the people in New Orleans and coming back and giving back. So I want to thank you on behalf of the residents of District B and of Central City. It's because of your commitment and your unwavering support of this city and this community that gives us the hope to continue to win. It's good to know Thanksgiving that you all's hearts still here, that you never forgot where you came from. Thanks a lot. This is us now. 18 years of giving back to my community, my neighborhood. People that helped me, watched me grow up, that raised me, knew my mama, knew my daddy, knew my family, saved us, tried to teach us and show us. But, you know, being young, we just did what we felt we wanted to do. Couldn't give, so we took. You know, uptown, everybody know each other. Everybody know what everybody about. And I love my neighborhood. I never leave it. But I'm gonna bring you back. Show you the life before we had anything. My name is Kim Williams. I am the sister of Brian Baby Williams, Ronald Williams. My oldest sister was Joyce Simpson. And it was me. We grew up on Saratoga Street, and we lived on top of Gladys Bar, which was my mother's barroom. Love and happiness. Yeah. Something that can make you do wrong, make you do right. Yeah. Love. When we were children, we got along very well. We, you know, sister, brother, we played, did everything children would do. All the neighborhood kids knew each other. We always was around, we played, hung out, act crazy, you know, do little kid stuff. Pitch up tackle, that was one of our favorite ones we had, pitch up tackle. We tried to play our uncle on the neutral front. <laughs> that didn't work out. <laughs> It was too much smaller than it was. That part didn't work out at all. Slim and Kim was the oldest of everybody, so, you know, they tried to bully us. But, you know how that goes. As children, you could see what they was taught at home. Share with your friends, share with your neighbor, you know, don't be self. Everybody knew everybody in the neighborhood. Everybody, you know, pretty much was family on Saratoga Street. Much as I can remember, uh, my mom always was sick. She would be on oxygen and going back and forth to the hospital. After she come out of the hospital, she had this tank where they had to put this oxygen thing for her to breathe. And I would go over there and clean up and wash and fix food for the children so she wouldn't have to try to do that. She didn't want to feel sick because she, she still had that strong feeling. You know, she was strong. The Gladys was strong. My mama' name was Gladys. Her mama name was Gladys. She had the same name. My oldest sister. She was named Gladys, but they called her Margaret. I mean, I was a teenager. My mother was living in Hammond, and she was living in a town called Punchatula. And uh, I stayed over there with her a long time, her and I was very close also. I heard my grandmama was a wonderful woman, beautiful woman, but unfortunately, she died in the car wreck. But my mom moved uptown New Orleans on Saratoga Street. And that's where it started. She wasn't raised in that block, but she came by regular to see her aunt. Matter of fact, I don't really know Gladys' mother. She would be by her two aunties, which were staying in the same block I was. But her and I was real close. 
And if she wanted to talk about something, she would call me and come to me. That's how close her and I were, like if I was a mother figure in her life. And she was tall, dark, well-built. She was a good-looking young woman. Bertha and uh, Earlene, they were just regular young women's having a good time. She just used to tickle me with her walk. I just loved her walk. I'm 82 years old now. When I dress up and put my high heel shoes on and my clothes, I'd be trying to walk like glass. <laughs> I would never forget that walk. I just heard so many different stories about my mom, how beautiful she was, how sweet of a woman she was, how everybody loved her. Then she met my daddy, Mr. Johnny. Johnny had been down there a while, you know, but I know Gladys wasn't his first wife. That I know. My pops was a military man. He went in at a real young age, stayed in it for like 19 years. He married Dorothy Williams real young. She was 16. We was teenagers, you know, right? We was children. He's four years older than I am. He was tall, dark, boy, joined the military, and got in love. I married him in the service. He come home, married him. Yeah, we went from Arkansas to Germany, and we stayed there three years. Now, he was the first sergeant, and um, we were on the ship, came back, docked in New York, left New York, went straight to a uh, car dealership, Pontiac car dealership. Uh, Dad bought a brand new Pontiac, and we drove that car from New York back to Arkansas. And uh, from there, um, that's when Dad went to New Orleans and bought that house on Jordan Avenue. He liked to, uh, to gamble. Um, he was lending money. Uh, he would uh, charge you a quarter for each dollar he would let you have. He would lend you, not let you have. And he got caught. And that's where his problems ended up. And uh, that's what he got uh, discharged for. He was in prison in, in the Army post on, in uh, uh, Texas. There was an article in the paper where he had to put up, he put up some money to get released. I talked to him. He said, I ain't gonna gamble no more. And go right on down, come out, and uh, stay home and just run the street. Start to run the street. <laughs> and we stayed together until he got about 40, about 40 or 50 something years old. I just couldn't stay with him. Just gambling, gambling, yeah. That's right. He was a quiet person, you know. And uh, he didn't tell you all his business. He just told you what he wanted you to know. And that was it. I got 10 brothers, 12 sisters, two sets of twins, Nell, Andrew, Nell, Robert, Gracie. And this was all before us. I do remember him coming to Kansas City when we were younger. He uh, brought my grandmother here to stay with us. He had came that night, him and I think it was Jungle Man that came with him. And after he left, I didn't see him anymore until I was 13. You know Pops was a roller. He left Kansas City and went back to New Orleans. My daddy met my mama, there wasn't no going back. Straight off top, they stuck together. And they started dating and moved together. To be honest with you, they didn't care for Gladys' husband, Johnny, at that time. 
they're learning to, you know, they accept them, but at the beginning, they like, because it was a uh, age different. different, you know, by her being a younger woman and him being an older man. She was real young, in her early 20s. She had met a nice man, and uh, him and her was dating, that's all. I said, well, good for you, just like that, you know, because I was happy she had met a, a nice young man. It made me happy. And I never forget, she asked me, how you look, Auntie? I said, well, he handsome, <laughs> and we laughed. <laughs> My pops was a hustler, straight out the military. He was all about some money. When they came around here, baby wasn't born at the time. It was Kim, Ronald, Marie, then I entered the world. When I found out he was born, I asked, what you got? She said, a boy, another boy. Everybody was happy. Everybody would say he was a darling, pretty little baby. He wasn't named until he came out the hospital. For about maybe two, three weeks, we used to call him Baby Brooks. And everybody used to go to me, well, I'm glad. What, what his name? She said, baby. About two, three weeks after that, she came up with a name, and she said his name Brian. But ain't nobody called him Brian because everybody knew him as Baby. I was born as Brian Brooks. That's my mama's last name. My pops never signed a birth certificate. They told me she had named him Brian, and I thought I thought that was a pretty name. I said, that's a pretty name. As a kid, I never seen my pops as much because he always was working. He had different businesses, so he stayed on the go. Baby and them was staying at 1222 because they were working on a bar at the time. They were trying to get it organized so he could do his thing. When I say he, I mean Mr. Johnny. When he came on Saratoga Street, he came to get the business. And the reason the place name is Gladys because Johnny couldn't put it in his name. They used to stay open 24-7, and he was trying to do the best he can for his kids. You know how they used to lend money, and they would call it two bits on a dollar and four bits on the money like that? That was one, he was always a hustler. Whether it was legal or illegal, he was always a hustler. He made a living for his family. He was a good dad, you know, made sure we had everything we needed. My father, he took care of us, basically. He raised us. He was my dad. Our family wasn't rich. And we, we, you know, we had to do what we had to do to get by. They didn't want as much like everybody else had, but I didn't say they were rich, but they had a little bit more, put it that way. My mom died when I was eight years old. Um, baby was five, turning six, and Ronald was 10 years old. The night before she passed, her and I talked on the telephone. And I said, how you feeling? She said, I don't feel too good. She said, I might go to the hospital later on. I said, well, I'll go with you. She said, no, don't want you to go with me. She said, I'm going to be all right. If I go, I'm going to go 40 in the morning. Ain't nobody there. She was worried about Brian, because Brian was a little boy. She said, well, I don't know. If I go, I'll call you back. And I was going to keep Brian for her. And she didn't call me no more that night. I called her back. The phone rang, rang, rang. I ain't getting no answer. So I thought maybe they were asleep. The next day, my husband called me at work. When I called her that morning, I didn't get no answer before I went to work. So I went on to work. I said, well, she must be all right. I went on to work. Then my husband called me the next day and told me she had passed. And I said, passed? I had no idea, you know, she was that sick because the way she was talking to me on the phone didn't sound like she was sick enough to pass away, you know. And I just broke down when he told me that I couldn't help. And that was, that was the hardest thing he could have ever told me, to listen to something like that. Um, I can remember when they told us that she passed, how um, it took a toll on us. We were very young. We cried so much until we, you know, threw up. We were so sick, you know, we were young. Our mother passed. It, it just broke my heart, this child passed away on me. It just, I'm sorry, I don't mean to. <laughs> I was 
five years old when my mama passed. Just a dark day in life. Kinda hard for me, hard for us, to try to continue living life without my mama. My mama brother Joseph, he flew down from Canada to visit my mom, but he didn't know that she passed. Him and my sister decided to get me, Kim Slim, and Ray and take us for a ride. We drove from New Orleans to Canada. It was me, Slim, baby, and my nephew, Kevin. Now, at that age, we didn't know where we was going. We know we were just ride. I mean, for days. Next minute, we know we coming from sunshine to snow. We were like, Ma, where we at? Man, we was in Canada, Prince George. Being out here in Canada, knowing my mama just passed, I'm young and I just was angry all the time. I stayed inside a lot. You know, it was cold anyway in Canada, snowing all the time. All I can remember, it was snowing and it was cold in Canada. I know my father wanted us back because uh, I've been told that he worried very much. Returning to New Orleans was something I wanted because I wanted to be with my daddy, knowing I just lost my mom. So we came back to New Orleans. I don't, I can't, I don't remember much of that. I just remember being back in New Orleans. We pretty much separated. My mom went her own way and she took me, of course. And you know, baby Slim and Kim stayed with their dad. When we came back, you know, he had to turn us over to childcare because they were looking for us because we didn't have a legal guardian. So we became property of the state. We was put in a boy's home for like two years. My pops went back and forth to court and proved that he was our biological. And when my pops got us back, my name became Brian Williams. Yeah, we back on the block. Yeah, back with Pops. This is where I always wanted to be, be with my Pops. And have to face responsibility. Now that my mom's passed, Pops had to move on. So we had to respect that. My name is Patricia Williams. And I met Johnny in 1974. Some friends and I used to go by his bar and eat seafood. He had a, a Wednesday seafood. I met him and we began talking. He had just gotten the kids back where he had got the lawyer to do the procedure of the adoption and everything. Johnny worshiped his children. He always was a, a person, took a lot of time with the kids. There was playing ball, wrestling. We started dating at that point because I had the younger boy's son, which was Eldrick, he had an apartment over the bar. It was a small apartment at that time. About eight months later, we started living together. And we grew up on the top of this building. Two bedroom house, bathroom, kitchen. We used to play around here. I mean, it was just, just like a family thing around here. Me, Eldrick, and Baby used to hang together. And my brother, Frank, and Ronald, used to hang together. At night time, and when they in here, you'll hear the music when you sleep while it's being upstairs. And they going in a ballroom at the age of, yeah, right. Like they Young wasn't age. supposed to be in, in the bar. The baby's six years old. He'd run through the bar, get $10 like it was a dollar way back then. And then he'd go out, maybe be gone about a couple of hours and come back and Johnny would give him five or ten more. Baby was real Bishop sport. Brian. Oh, That's Brian, well, that was his That boy. was his heart. Mm -hmm. Brian. Brian. <laughs> I'm in Johnny's just Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brian. I said, you shouldn't do that. You're sprawling him. And Johnny would always say, I ain't worried about that. He said, because uh, my baby Brian one day going to be a millionaire. My husband said this. He said this. And I'm not saying baby said this. This is what his dad said about him. I think what Johnny was doing was basically teaching them the business role and the responsibility of taking on a business role. So they had jobs before we knew what it was to work. As a kid, 
I saw it all. Everything went down on the block. Hustling, tricking, prostitutes, drugs, everything. Joe Shorty was in the 1300 block and all the little prostitutes used to come through the alley. Had pimps around there, had prostitutes. If you wanted to find like a hookup around here, this was around here, the area, where you look at? Going in and out. It was no shame. They was doing it like it was a nine to five job. Central City, that's the worst place in the world. It's almost like a bottomless pit. And Joe Charlie was like right on the next block from Gladys was here and it sits on the next block. So we seen all of that by playing in the streets and all that. We seen all, in fact, we knew a lot of them. This ballroom used to stay open 24 hours a day. You had a lot of drugs dealing, going on in the neighborhood. A lot of stuff went on. Murder, just game at the game that whatever they can do to you to get anything out of you, meaning money or uh, any of your possessions, they will do around there. So that was a rough place to come up at. You wasn't gonna take nothing from my husband. You wasn't gonna take nothing from him. Knowing my pops stay strapped, but this particular day, he wasn't. We had just come from the wrestling match that night. And they had about three or four people in the bar. He was up in the ballroom and all of them was having a good time, not paying attention to what really was going on at the time. And I had just brought the kids upstairs to make them take their bath to go to bed. And I heard the gunshot. And next thing you know, we heard like maybe two shots. And everybody broke out and ran. And I run downstairs. And Johnny was tussling with the guy. The, the gun had went off. Johnny was tussling with the guy. And Johnny got shot in the side. We ran around the block. And we come back. They said, oh, Mr. Johnny shot, Mr. Johnny shot. Somebody tried to rob him. He got shot up in here. The guy, they, they got away. But I, I heard later that the, one of the guys got killed the next week trying to do the same thing to somebody else on Barone Street. I don't know who tried to rob him. Nobody in the neighborhood tried to rob him. Nobody in the neighborhood. It's some stranger. It's a stranger. No one went home. And like I say, he was generous. He was a kind hearted person. The block was like a family. Everybody knew everybody. That's where it went down. So my pops sent us two blocks up by Miss Antoinette. What number five guys in the block? Baby and Ronald, and me and my brother, and another guy called Man. We was the only guys in the block. So the boys liked to play together. We played football, baseball, everything in that block. But Mr. John, he wanted us to make something out of our life. When you see we doing something wrong, he'll tell us, threaten us, if you keep doing the same thing, I'm a beach and all this is so. We try to stay on the right track because you know he was always watching us. Saratoga's was... <sighs> like I said, a ghetto area compared to where we was able to move up to. Johnny had to move from with them from off top of that ball, right? That's yeah, why they told like him he Johnny had to get a house. Yeah, he had to get a house. Johnny couldn't have him stay over a ball. That was the law said he couldn't stay out there with those kids. My pops decided to buy a house because the police was harassing him so much. We moved off Saratoga, further uptown. We moved uptown New Orleans on Valence Street. And we just had a normal life, you know, as normal as possible. <laughs> Three kids, Johnny had three kids. And we never believed in step. I didn't treat baby as if he was a stepchild. I didn't look at him like that. I felt like he was mine. Kim, it was hard for her saying, Mom, she always addressed me as my stepmother. I think she just had a hard time adjusting to losing her mom. They loved Saratoga, and they once they met new friends on Valence Street, they loved them too. Still coming back and forth on Saratoga Street, but the bulk of the friends was up on the other end. It was nice over there. They had what, four bedrooms, so then we get you had Mr. Johnny and Pat, then had Kim had her room. Then Elgin Baby, you know, they still all of them still in, the, in one room together. 
So we have bump beads in there. We have two bump beads where it'd be four of us, so we, them two on that side, the other two on this side here. Man, when you think it's just gonna be four of y'all in one room, before you know it, man, it's like it's like six or seven of us in there. They was living way up amongst people like us, like low-class people, you know what I mean? So they was just beautiful in the house and everything. Baby and Kim fussed the most. Eldrick and Kim was the, the closest because he wouldn't, he wouldn't mess with her as hard as Baby would mess with her. He would do little things to aggravate her. And Ronald and Kim was close to them. My grandfather and my grandmother raised me. They were so particular about me going around stepdads. But when they first met Mr. Johnny, there was nothing they could keep me from him. They grew up good together. They got along. Me and Baby stayed probably like four blocks from each other. He stayed on Valen Street. I stayed on Robert Street. That's like uh, three blocks, four blocks apart from each other. It was a young crew, me, Baby, his brother Eldred, Slim, Corey, Joe Casey, Casey, Vamp, Pat Norwood. Man, it was like 20 or 30 as young kids that was growing up in that 13 wall area. And we just, like regular little dudes at first playing football and popping wheelies. Every day they just, they played ball in the street. In the middle of the street they played ball, skated, doing things like that. It was a residential neighborhood that we made out of project. Just they had no bricks. <laughs> it was invisible bricks. Miss Pat, she raised me. My mom was like a mama to him. I'm in the Magnolia Projects, so that's like right up the street. My dad uh, was in and out the jailhouse, you know, ever since I was like three years old. My father owned a ballroom in a limousine service. So, like, me and baby them came up with some daddies who had clever entrepreneur minds. When I went to them, you know, it was like I was escaping from the projects. Pat accepted me in as her own child, and but at the same time, I had to follow the same rules if I wanted to lay here instead of 2615 Valley. The house they moved in actually was the biggest house on the block. So when the house, they moved in the house, like, that is moving in the house. So it actually was baby. A friend of mine was like, but they really real good in baseball, but go down there and talk to them. You know, they're good people. So I went down there, we got acquainted, and we just went from there. Christmas Day was like one of the days that we really got acquainted with each other because we were like on Mongoose BMX bikes and they roll out the driveway on mini bikes. Like just took off up the block. They was the only two had mini bikes around there. We were able to pop wheelers on a bicycle. They were like just zooming by us on mini bikes. So, you know, it was just one of those things as kids, you know, like, man, why we ain't getting none of those? Everybody in their mom wanted to ride their bikes. That's why everybody started hanging around there. We were like, God damn, these boys got mini bikes. We met through family because we consider ourselves as family. I stayed on Liberty Street, which is only four blocks away from uh, where Baby House was at. We always say cuz, a fam, something like that, because we were born and raised to be like that, and we kept that vow. If you're in the same block or in a, say, like a four, five block radius, everybody try to be really family. Even though you're not kin, you still kin. So all of us got kind of close, and, and it just went from them. Once we moved on Valley Street, it was a different site from where we come from, where everybody was cool. We go back and forth from Saratoga to Uptown. One, two, get down. We grew close, and I grew especially close to Baby, because he was the youngest. And Eldrick and Baby was like six months apart. Eldrick, which was my mama's son, him and Baby was close. He gave Baby somebody after his mama died, had somebody to be with. They hung together, they did their dirt together. He was the clown. He clowned a lot. You get Eldrick, you gonna have some fun with Eldrick around. Funny, active, loud. He used to call himself LL Kudrick. He used to rap, I'm bad, all the time. And they were real close. Ladies love Al, you know. He was a playboy, you know. Eldrick was wilder than Baby. Baby was quieter than Eldrick. They was always tight, had a lot of the similar to the same clothes. Anybody that didn't know wouldn't have thought they was real brothers and stepbrothers. They was just really close. In our neighborhood, everybody came up 
had a little brother. It was Stan and Pat, it was me and my little brother, it was Ernest and his little brother, it was Lewis and his little brother, it was Baby and Eldridge, it was uh, Baby and Slim, or Baby Slim and Eldridge. Slim is uh, tall like my grandfather. Hey, Slim gonna say only when it needs to be spoken to. You don't even know Slim in the building, but he be thinking, he always thinking. He always thinking, you know? You know, he like to be behind the scene, you know, but he putting stuff together, you know? Well, Slim kind of stayed under Mr. Johnny a lot. That's why he got that wisdom. Slim don't say too much. Slim was on the quiet side. Johnny taught him yeah. to be the business and run the business. And Slim was doing his own little thing too, though, because Slim had this little crew. Me, Ronald, Bean, and Frank, Frank Washington. So we all used to hang out all the time together. You know, the tall dudes, even though I was tall too, but I was a tall hustler. They was tall chilling. We called him 6'9", too, by the way. We had his name, because that was his height. Slim really kept us out of a lot of stuff, too. Slim sit back, lay back, but he knew everything going on. <laughs> That's what he do. Him and Baby always had this here relationship, I got your back. The bus don't leave without my brother. This girl ain't gonna come between me and my brother. That's how Slim and Baby is. Baby and Slim thing was, we gonna change this situation from our parents doing for us until we gonna do for our parents. I always respected my brother as my big brother. And we always just held each other down, always. He was good playing football. He was a hell, cause we had a little football team too. You know, we had a Sandlock football team and we used to go play other teams in the neighborhood. I thought he was gonna be a football player because that's what he used to always tell me. I'm gonna be a football player doing it because he always talk about, I want to be a running back. They play baseball, they play basketball, they play football. Sponsors were ball owners and they would go around trying to get teams to play for them. Because Mr. Johnny, like my mom said, if he's seen a dollar could be made, he gonna follow that road. A lot of people don't know it, but he was a real, real good athlete. So his mom and dad actually sponsored the baseball team and played in all baseball. Mr. John used to follow us. We played for other bars, but he would have his truck out there selling food and everything, or chips and beers and stuff, and he would bet big money on us. So Mr. John won a lot of money on our baseball abilities. They won like three championships back to back. Sports was my first love and I thought that would be my way of getting out the neighborhood. I can remember getting up going 5 o'clock in the morning to go get seafood for the bar, all that kind of stuff. And he would be up. Stan, you coming? Yeah, I'm up. Let's go. We would ride with his dad to go all the way down to Chalmette to go get hampers of crabs to boil for the bar. They would have seafood night at the little bar. I would do it was to sweep the ballroom first, mop the ballroom, the delivery truck, would come and I said the deliver truck, the beer truck, so they could generate the money that's going on in the family to lay here and support their children. My daddy always taught me to be a leader, follow no one, be your own man. And I watch him since a kid just be his own man. And I follow his footsteps. The basement was a place where some people who wasn't familiar with the house and wasn't familiar with the family, that's as far as they go. That was the place that everybody hung out was in their basement. All kind of decisions were made in the basement. Some shit went on in that basement, bro. Sometimes you could be a kid making grown up decisions to do some things. And when they made up their minds to just get into it, whether it was right things or wrong things, the decisions were made directly in that basement. That's where it went down, but it was just a, a certain amount of people that knew about it or coming there. Drugs, girls, crime. Bagged up everything, rolled up everything, count money down there. Shooting in the basement, everybody hiding in the closet because they shooting down the alley, fights. Shot dice down there for three, four days straight. You will stay in the house and Miss Pat wouldn't even know. You be in the room, they be in the next room, and they'll have to hide you and all this stuff. It seemed like the landscape had changed in the community from playing football outside and basketball in the park to grinding. Man, Coke, you should have broke because I ain't no joke. We was getting into fashion. Me and him and some of our friends would go on Canal Street to like Dillard's, Macy's, and steal polo shirts out of them. You go to Canal Street, I know you was broke when you left. I ain't have no money, you ain't have no money, but you could come back with all kind of shit. Like, where, where, where you get all this stuff from? We'll go in these stores and just tackle a store. Just everything that we can take out of it, we'll take out of it. Decisions was made by all of us. Stunner had this sharp edge in life, you know. 
he had a better mindset. Mr. Johnny, my dad would always say sometimes all money is not good money, but he would say all money is green money. So his determination, it wasn't so much that they were not well off, it was just his determination to be independent and do for himself. Regards to what it took, he would make it happen. Once you become clean and going to school with all kind of polos and everything on, you know, the next thing come, how you gonna get you a car and some money? They had to go to school, had to. And if they got in, into any trouble, I wouldn't be the one to find out. He told one of my best friends when they was in junior high, like, I'm gonna be a big time rapper mogul one day. I mean, he called it. Uh, he was in the eighth grade when he called that shot. School was something I enjoyed doing. I always wanted to be smarter and learn. I looked forward to going, and my school was in my neighborhood. Middle school, Woodson, they were, um, he would hang with these group of guys, and they, I guess they was getting in trouble back then. So our typical day was get up in the morning before we go to school, you know what I mean? I'd get up in the morning, go take care, roll up, do this, get everything prepared, so when I, by the time I come outside, everybody already, you know what I mean, on the corners, you know, walking away to school, like, I mean, you want to, if I, you do that, you do your little thing, and you go on to school, like, like a normal day, because your parents were strict about you, you know what I mean, you gotta be at school. As he transitioned into like that early teenage stage, his just determination to just make some money because he was coming from a situation where his dad always was there to produce some money. So the deal was, I don't want to depend on my dad. My dad not going to be here forever, but I don't know what it was about him that said, you know what, it's time to take on adult decisions and do things either right or wrong, I'm going to make them work. He went from you know, wanting to do break dancing and all this, and all of a sudden that shit just came to a halt. It's like, I'm, it's time to make some money. Around that time, what they was playing, three to something hours, an hour or something. Why would I go do that? It don't add up. And drugs was the only way for us to continue to, the, the weather, the, the fancy clothes, and then we started driving cars, and at the time, you know, everybody wanted a nice whip with some rims on it. First of all, I tell him to stay inside, so he was inside with it anyway. I'm the one that really was on the corner, you know what I mean? And nobody really knew it, because he'd go to school. Yeah, our parents kind of strict, but they didn't know what we was doing. We played that role. Word, man, he had like, he had probably 10, 15 cars, he didn't even know, houses, everything. I could recall him having a fascination with cars in his early teens. By the time he was 16, he had seven cars but nobody would ever see him. He would park cars all over. When he leave, he walking. When he go where he going, he drive. Where he going, he gonna drive, he gonna park probably five blocks away and walk up to where he's going. He bought a, a Oldsmobile and I thought it was so funny. And he had metal flakes in it like on a boat and with some trues and vogues and I had bought me a Cadillac like just plain white Eldorado with a wheel on the back and he went and got this um, Buick Oldsmobile painted like, had the boat metal flakes in it, like it was so metal flaked out. And that's when I knew Baby was different. They were just parked on the streets, like, like around the corners, some all over, the, just everywhere. They were just parked. Cadillac had like Cimarron, a Mustang, a Suzuki Samurai. He had the Audi with the white interior. His Impalas, like the two, we had the two-door and the four-door. A Buick LeSabre a Lincoln Town car. The Taurus with the white interior. He bought a Taurus and he bought a uh, Taurus station wagon and he put them loud colors on it again with white interior. And I knew then, I said, baby, it's different from all of us. Every time a car came out back at that time, this was just on and through the street. He was, he was getting every call that actually came out. Growing up in the projects, I was infatuated with money, jewelry, cars, power, something we never had. A good student, did well in school. If he in the 10th grade, you in the 11th, your book sack is done. Summertime, him, baby, they would do that kind of stuff to read over so they know everything they need to know. The next school year, they'll do all their school work in advance so that if they missing school for a reason, the work is covered. Everybody else got book sacks. This dude got a briefcase. He carried a briefcase like Johnny Cochran or one of them carried a briefcase to lay here and go represent his client. He was going to represent his future. He was going to represent himself, his family, me, other people, family and friends. High school was cool for me. I went to John Mack because I ain't going to follow my partners. But my 12th grade year, I decided to go to school uptown, so I went to Fauche. You know, I was playing ball and we was balling at the same time. But when I got kicked off the team, streets was the life.
one of the conversations was uh, I got to meet me a connect to get out of this stuff because I can't find no job, uh, can't open up a business because my dad already have a ballroom. Mr. Johnny was much older. He was like, you know, my dad not gonna be able to do for us forever. It was no way out but to say I need to meet me somebody or I need to stand on the cone all night till I get my money right so I can, you know, get myself out of this here poverty. Whatever he said out of his mouth really, like, if it came true, it was just like a reality, like he saw it before. One time, we was we went and rode by out in the Porsche shop on Tulane Avenue. Gabe said, one day, Joe, I'm gonna be able to buy all this shit. If it came up with a plan to do something, it was like his decision, solely his decision. He wasn't allowing nobody else to just, you know, Come on, man, I think you should know that ain't gonna happen. Whatever baby had idea, he put it into a plan and it always came out right. The only way we was able to do that, we had to talk about how we was gonna come up. And come up was taking the chance on selling drugs. It was never, I'm gonna do enough for me. He would always make a decision that was gonna provide for more than just him. When we come outside, then we took care of business outside. Not in the yard, not in front of the door. We go down in the corner, you know what I mean? But you had to be good at selling to be able to accumulate enough money to get the things that can get you away from that environment that, you know, created that ideal that we could sell drugs. When we used to come uptown on that block, everybody was already in position. Like, we used to come, I used to come up there, he used to probably give me about 10, 15 of them bundles at a time. They gone as soon as I hit the corner. They had already sold up the area where we was at in the 13th, while he had already, like, uh, controlled the neighborhood around there, so I had to go in another area that nobody ain't really stayed claim to yet. We sell cocaine and crack, so you know what I mean? It's like, this, we grew with all this stuff, but very low key. We was on some real hardcore comrade shit, you know? He kept us eating, you know? You know, when we didn't have nothing, baby will come up with us. He'll call in the morning, see coming through, drop you off something, and keep it moving. And uptown was like the middle of the world. We the third wall, you know, the Mac, the Melf, the Calio, 6 and B, the Rat Hole, Philip and Clara, the 10 wall, the 7 wall, the 8 wall. Everybody have their different walls, but everybody in certain walls ain't respected. Stunner could go anywhere. And when a man is respected as a man, he can go in all them other walls, be saluted, and have their hat laid here and tipped off to them. Everybody in their mom had something from him, some type of product. He had all them dudes around there. Now the motherfucker not around there didn't work for baby. And that's real shit. We had other little guys that we dealt with, but, but not on the right, on the stunner. Like everybody we used to have our own little crew. Like Joe had his little people that he go out and give his things to. I had my people. But a lot of them is dead, man. It's, you know, this city here, bro. It's hard in New Orleans, bro. Cause New Orleans is born killers out here, man. It's really the reality of it. Baby the type of dude to be running all day. Next time you hear from Baby, it might be one o'clock that night, and he gonna ask you, do you wanna go to the club? And then if he ain't go to the club, he gonna tell you, come by his house, y'all will play some kind of game or something. Uh, you gonna smoke some weed, <laughs> you gonna drink some drinks, and, and, and that's it. They gonna start all over in the morning, the same cycle. You know, a hustler's anthem is, you know, it never stopped till my body dropped. He was dealing with people on another level that I was. I was, I was getting to see that he had to book down, but he was on another level doing it way higher and bigger than me. What I was doing was looking good for me, but what he was doing was already cash in, cash out. Baby was the first dude I ever seen on earth wear two watches. I ain't never seen nobody in my life when we was come up, when he had two Rolexes on, I thought this dude had went crazy. But he had a, a house like around the corner from our house, and nobody knew that it was his house. It's called, in New Orleans, we have doubles, you know, two-sided apartments. And um, you'll put bars all on the back door, front door, and all on the windows, and you'll just sell rocks out the door. You'll cut a little square hole in the door where they'd be able to hand you their money and go back and forth. Uh, baby had one of them houses, and um, I seen him work about a year or two, and after that, I seen him come up. He was real respectful. Cut the grass, he would tell the people next door they get the grass cut. He would always say his uncle lived there and he was watching the house for his uncle. Cause niggas ain't know we was playing with that kind of money at this type of age, you know what I mean? Like serious money, like serious, serious money. A guy went broke into a car and 
people followed him to that house, and that was the house he went to, and he was going to that house to buy weed and buy drugs. The police actually came, they kicked the door in. Six in the morning, police at my door. Fresh should be the squeak across the bathroom floor. Every day was a work day for Mr. John. You know, he had so many things going on at the time. I mean, you got a grocery store, you have a, a ballroom, you have the, the food truck, he had rental property. He was a numbers man, he played uh, the horse races, he was involved in all that stuff. So rarely did he actually have time to sit down and say, boy, what y'all doing down there? We didn't approve of any of that. And when we found out about it, you know, we, uh, we was like, we was shocked and hurt you know, talking to them and all, they got in trouble and they went to jail. I'm a mother. Mothers are different from fathers. So I wanted to get them out of jail. Johnny said, no, no. They do wrong, we taught them different. They're gonna stay in jail, we're not getting them out. I said, Johnny, I think I left the state in that like about two days. The next morning I told John, I said, look, I'm getting them children out of jail. He didn't agree with me. And it was very few things that John and I didn't agree. It was their first time getting in trouble. And um, they got out. When they kicked in the house and they did what they did, they roughed them all up. I think they might have took like 80 grand, like $80,000 in cash that they nobody knows nothing about. No kind of way the police just, and it was a jack move. They took them to jail. And I mean, I'm talking about the charges were like, went from all kinds of shit to like a few charges because they knew they had them took some money. So his thing was he had to recoup that money. So he was insisting upon when he bonded out of jail, to making a move that he probably would have never actually made. They went to the St. Thomas to school. They got out one weekend. The next weekend, they was back in again. Yeah, when they got caught coming out that St. Thomas, because they was throwing all black dudes away. They was throwing all of us away at that time. We thought they was over then. It backfired. He wound up getting popped with two people. I'm saying two people, he would say one, but I, to this day, me and him argue about that. I'm like, it was more than one, it was two people. The people had heat on their back already. And they was just, they had to bring in somebody. So they chose your ass to bring into it. You not in their circle. You knew one, but you don't know the other one like that. But you know, and that was one of his things that he never really do. Being in jail made me realize this ain't where I want to be. This ain't how I'm going to live. I learned all the tricks of the trade at a young age. When I visited him in jail, we talked, and he said that he would, um, once he get home, he would change his life. Me and Slim choose to go see Baby, and my mom and my other sister choose to go see Elder, because we had to see him at the same time. He used to always tell me, Rita, he said, when I get out here, I'm going to do right. I said, baby, I see so many of them come out, get be in jail, and come out here and say that, and go back and do the same old thing. And he said, Rita, I'm going to do right. Jail just make you know that, like, if I'm going to do this shit, I'm going to do this shit right, because this what, is this what they got for me? This what they have set for me uh, to come sit down when, when, when they figure like they done caught me up in what I'm trying to do. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do my shit better so they won't never sit me down again. The last time we went to jail together, I squared up. And when he got out, he squared up. I said, man, that's enough, bro. When I was in jail, I read the entire Bible. It changed my mindset and it changed my life. When you coming from the streets, selling drugs, killing, back and forth to jail, putting 18 to 20 years out there on the slab, you got to know somebody, mama, grandmother, auntie, is praying for you. You done gave up everything that you had, your worldly possessions that God created you. You gave it up to work for the devil because you know 
what you putting out here is not something that is going to produce itself. It only take away from itself. So you're going to need your grandma, the neighbor. You're going to need just a person who see the police hacking you up. Lord, I hope that boy get his life together. You may not even know him. People with silent prayer up going in the prayer closet for you. Uh, going to church and telling the preacher that I have a boy, could you keep him in the church, keep him in their prayer? Because that's the only thing that can get you to where we are now. Baby, real religious, him and Slim, man. Real religious. They know, they know, they know this by the grace of God. Anytime things went opposite of what he said, shit just never worked out right. They tried to rob him downtown. Somebody kicked in and started shooting through the door. They could have killed him then, him and Joe Casey, when they robbed him downtown around John Mack. He got out of that with the blessing of God. We would pray and cover them in prayer and just ask God to keep them. I guess it just makes your faith grow to know that the grace of God is that powerful to keep you in the midst of all this negativity. And they have many friends that they've helped to bury today, and yet they're still alive. So. It just show you the testament of their spirituality. Coming from where they came from, you know, and, and then the background they had with the mamas, their dad is my mama, my dad and my grandmother, his grandmother, you know, they always believed in prayer. And like they say, you know, you had people around you that was praying when you wasn't even praying for yourself. You may pray, like God, get me out this. And I'm not gonna go back, right? It might not happen when you want it to, so I'm going to test you. I'm not going to give it to you right off back. I ain't going to give it to you right off back. I'm going to see if you're going to go back. And if you don't go back, I'm going to bless you. And that's what he did. He got blessed. Being in jail, I learned a lot. So when I do get on the block, be smarter, wiser, do shit my way. He came out with a whole different mind state. When I say a whole different mind state, he came out with a whole different mind state, which means he was on this positive kick. He was like, you know, I'm coming home. Continue, come home, but still did the same thing, though. But this time, certain people he had to leave behind. Reaching and attaining a certain level streetwise, a lot of people wanted to deal with him. But because of his way that he dealt with things, and he chose not to, he could choose not to deal with you because he feel like you talk too much. He could choose not to deal with this one because he want to be on Front Street all the time. He could choose not to deal with this one because he knows that one. He ain't right, so he would just exclude a whole bunch of people in the neighborhood. He would only deal with like one person out of the neighborhood. Fast money brings a lot of trouble, brings on heartaches, but you know, as you get older, you realize, man, I could put my energy in something else that'll make legit money, and I don't even have to do this. Now I say to myself, man, this cat been in jail. I come out with this, this mind state, this idea to do this here. So if you say to yourself, if he can, put together a, a group of guys to, to go out there and make such X amount of dollars for him, he can use his mind to do something else. And that's what he did. Well, the first day I seen Baby coming home, I was coming up uh, Robert Street almost to Ferret. He was coming up the street drinking some eight ball or old English or something. I know he had a quart in his hand. And uh, he had that baggy jogging suit jacket on, and he told me he, he about to bust it open. Busting it open when you gonna get all your drugs, you're going to make the block hot, the police can come, the robber man can come, but at the end of the day, you're going to win. They was dealing, you know. Eldrick was like in that drug, dealing drugs. And Eldrick called me that night, so I knew I wasn't worried about him, me coming home. The next day, I didn't hear from him. I knew something was wrong. My mama called me, she said, Eldrick ain't come home, and it wasn't like him not to come home. Because he was going to let me know 
wherever he was. And I called the police. The guy told me, he said, well, I can't do anything about it. He said, because it's been, it haven't been 24 hours. I said, I'm telling you something is wrong with, something is wrong. I don't know what it is, but something is wrong. I said, because this is not my son. I said, my son calls me when he's not coming home. This is not him. You know, baby might not want to call, but Eldrick was going to call and let you know. And that Sunday morning, it was a father, Father's Day. My family and everybody was up there. And we was, everybody was worried because we still hadn't heard from him. I call a detective back again. I say, something is wrong. He said, well, we didn't check. Uh, we didn't check the jails. He's not in the jails. He's not in the hospitals. He said, maybe he just went off somewhere. I said, no, this is not him. He don't do that. Something is wrong with him. Well, they said he had a John Doe. But just, he has a tattoo on him and he has a gold. I said, well, my son do have a tattoo on him and he does ha have a gold. And then he said, he said, well, I'm gonna say one thing. He said, I hate telling parents that. He said, but check them all. That's when it really kind of hit me. So I said, okay. And my sister and my brother, they said, you know, you don't have to go. So we, we'll go, we go check it out. And my brother and sister left. I was just sitting, I was just, really just nearly like spaced out. Cause I knew something was wrong. I knew something was wrong, but not death. So when they come back in, the, when they come back, about an hour later, and uh, they didn't have to say anything to me, just to look in my sister's eye. I knew it. Just looking at it, I knew it. This lady come home, she found them on, you know, like her doorstep. So, but that's when I really think baby turned his life around. And, and, and you, you know, that's, that's what I think turned his life around. He's, he's, he's seen what happened, what, what stuff like that could do. We still don't know what happened. It's just like a big mystery. Maybe I would have lost another son. You know? When I lost Eldrick, as close as we was, really just made me give a fuck about life. They had that bond but nobody could take. And when we lost Eldrick, it was like devastating him. Right after Eldrick got killed, it was like, you know, he started to really transition that stuff, right, you know, for the most part, right? Because you, you can't get no closer than that. Devastation, uh, sadness, you know, bitterness. It was, it was a little bit of everything because, um, you know, they was, they was tight. It messed Babe up, but I think it opened his eyes up, too. So it did two things, you know. We don't realize when somebody died, it's not really about the dead. It's God trying to touch you in another way. I can remember the first house uh, he purchased on Hammond Street out in New Orleans East. I think the people made, I think he wanted like $75,000 for it. So he was thinking he could just go with $75,000 in cash to go buy a house. I'm like, no, it don't work that way. So, you know, he told his dad that he wanted to buy a house and dad was like, well, you got to cover the 20% down. And he said, well, I got the 20% down. So he was like, well, can you buy it in your name? For a long time, Mr. Johnny battled back and forth with him about going buy a house in his name. Because he was like, you know, if you don't have no way to show how you accommodated this money, you shouldn't be out here trying to go buy no house. But some kind of way, they called me back and said, Stan, we moving in. Him and Slim was getting apartments. They was buying houses. I'm talking about real talk. They was buying houses where everybody else was still living with their mamas. His focus never was 
what we could do today and have for tomorrow is what we can have for the rest of our life. Then from Hammer Street to a club on Downman, what was that, Magic City? Uh, club what was then the little, yeah. yeah, Club Magic. We went from there to uh, uh, Kit World, a little car body and fender shop. We partnered with some guys. They were all of these people who, they had things going, but they were strapped for cash and couldn't keep it going, so he wound up getting into partnership with them. When he get into partnership with them, then he wind up taking it over, then he sell the entire business. So it just, it went from that. It just started steamrolling from there. Eldrick used to always talk about rapping, rapping, rapping. Used to walk around rap, 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 right? So when Eldrick died, they may have inspired Baby to do it more so, because he knew that's what Eldrick wanted to do. We held a conversation one time in my room. How many hustlers on that side of the fence survive and retire from it without losing nobody, without nobody dying? I don't know about it going through some hell of a jail time. I don't know many winners. And he was like, well, I don't know none. If you said nobody died, nobody went to jail, I don't know none. I said, well, it's time to do something different. And he said, that's when he told me, he said, bro, I'm way ahead of you, Stan. I got my mind on something that's real serious. And at the time, New Jack City had came out. That's what we was playing with. <laughs> we was playing with real money, like at a young age, man. It was cash money. Growing up in these streets, watching a lot of my partners die and go to the penitentiary made me want to do something different in life. So I chose music and started Cash Money Records. They had hooked up this here record company and kept saying he gonna do it. And I was like, man, we in the street. I don't know nothing about no rap thing. What you talking about? I just, only thing I know is how to get out there and, and make that, that illegal money. He was like, Red, we gonna, it's, it's a way we can get over this and stop. He was like, if I take this step into the rap game, I don't want to do this. So when he got into the rap game, it was no more that, you know, like some people say we still do a couple and, and ruin the chances. He gave all that away. He gave away houses, all the old cars we had, all the houses he gave them to his family. Like they still exist today, Some they still stand in them. Like he gave all that away and he went out there with the rap and just stuck with it. But it ain't, ain't no more hitting and missing, still selling them. No, it wasn't none of that. He gave all that away. So him and Slim came up with an idea and it turned into a plan. All of a sudden he got the paperwork done on it. He took the same hustle to the music business. What, what really made me Look at Baby and Slim at that time, especially Baby, because me and Baby really ran day for day, night for night. I seen the determination. And me, myself, I was still on this negative thinking. And he was determined to say it was a better way and it's another way we can make money without selling these drugs on the street. They needed some money to do it. And um, they didn't have it, so me and Johnny, we gave it to them. So that they, they was able to do it. Straight stunting, cash up, money Woody? records in the house. Got it, got it all going on behind us. But so I got my man, Manny Fresh, what's in the up, house. What's up? What's and who, who's that other guy? Billionaire status, because <laughs> I've been having millions. You know how got the baby goes. in the house, CEO representing. All that, whatever you want to name it. Just call me money. Don P. Chris <laughs> Number one stunner, CMR for life. It don't matter. My dream as a youngster was to be successful. Be somebody, be a leader, grind hard, never quit, never fold, work for it. When the party over, we should be about 60 years old. Right. We're about 100 million drunk and chilling with our children. <laughs> Being in jail, coming home, thinking about how you could do something to better yourself, be something, be somebody. Then you lose that somebody who gave you the motivation to be somebody. Now life change again in a different way. I had so much, so much security at that hospital, they was just, they was just not accepting. They was just like, they was going crazy because my husband was in a car accident. The accident, you know, happened on Forest Street. You know, my mama called me and she told me, she said, oh, Mr. Johnny had an accident. I said, an accident? She said, yeah, somebody ran a stop sign on him and they ran into him, and he hit a house on Forest Street. See, when Johnny had the accident, they, they, they rushed you here to a trauma hospital. But Johnny's primary doctor was at 
a private hospital. So I called him the next morning after the accident because my first thing was to move him. And he told me, Patricia, he said, it's not going to do any good to move Mr. Johnny. He said, because 90% of his brain was dead from the accident. I couldn't tell my kids that, not from the beginning. I knew this, but I couldn't tell them that. But I knew that the state had to hold him on the machine three days. So I felt that that would give them time to sort of accept, along with me talking to them. The night that they, they pulled the plug, it was hard, really hard for them. Some of them didn't get along at first, but they, they got back together. You know, it was like Ron and Bryant, they was able to deal with it. Kim, it was really hard for her. Sharita, she was she 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 was able to deal with it. It was just it was just hard for them. They were just going at just like trying to pull away from each other in different ways. But they finally got right right back together. They pulled themselves right back together. It, it put a big dent in, in the people, you know, that he was really close to. But he gave Ronald, Kim, and Baby, he gave me an elder. Tomorrow wasn't even in the picture then. Only two people Baby wanted to listen to, Johnny and Slim. Slim was like baby next daddy beside Mr. Johnny. Mr. Johnny was just a full-fledged hustler, just a businessman, and a, a lot of the street savviness, I think Babe got that from his dad. He knew where he was headed, he knew what he wanted. Mr. Johnny was great. I, I learned a lot from him, you know what I mean? Because they used to have me in the house, and we thought that they was hiding me in the house. But Mr. Johnny was so smooth, he already knew I was in the house. A man that he said little, but you know, when he say something, he'll come, he'll observe everything. He know what's going on. Walk real, real light. He walk light. Sometimes we would be up in there bagging him. He would be right on our back. And the door open, be like, man, who? And Mr. John would be walking. But we would play it up, cover it up. And, you know what I mean? We already had the plan to cover it up if anything, somebody walk in the door, because the door was like right behind us. Everybody hear that car coming down the alley. And now we already in the basement. And it's like a little hallway, then you get to the basement part. Boy, everybody will run and hide in one closet because he didn't want to just see 30 dudes down there in his basement. I mean, even though we used to come down and hoop and house, tell me about him, I shouldn't be there. He ain't never really put me out of there, but I still stayed there like all my life. Mr. Johnny was a good man to us, huh? You know, he took care of all us, huh? He was just one of them parents who just figured, you know, I'd rather him be here not getting in trouble than to be on the streets, but he didn't know we was the trouble. Mr. John always tried to let you know to be legit and make the money that way where you don't have no trouble. Like Stunner would say, I seen it from a bird's eye view. His daddy seen it in him. But as a daddy, you're supposed to see a bright, successful future in your child. We just signed a big fat 30 milli or however you want to call it, 60, 80, but we just joined our company with Universal so everybody can watch out because we about to make it happen. Before the deal, you know, we was, we was the largest independent company in the world ever. We work hard to build this sound, 
And with the rappers and the flossing and all the balling we talk about, that's our thing. I'm Stunner and I'm the Birdman, Bubba B. Atchis, Brian and B. You could pick one and name it how you want to, pimp. A lot of people don't have the work ethics that Cash Money got, mm -hmm. you know? They not like hustlers like, you know, the way we hustle. I don't clone, you know what I mean? I am number one, you feel right, me? Right, right. I ain't no clones around here. It's one JR and one Birdman. We neighborhood superstars, Dad. I put all this together, me and my brother. Cash Money gonna represent Uptown, Downtown, New Orleans, whoever, whoever on this label, where they from, we gonna represent it. We straight Uptown, fresh from Downtown, and we gonna represent our award. You know, that's just us. That don't bring no money to us, but that's how we spit it. Right. That's just our motto. I don't even want to be on TV. They begged me to be on TV, but guess what? I'm going to show my ass, partner. I'm going to shine, and ain't nothing going to stop me. When I come through, homie, it's big rims, big ice, and big things. I'm telling you, it's all gravy, pimp. I'm really just into, you know, opening avenues and just altering my power. Still feel I'm a gang spitter. I can't rap. I got Wayne for that. Anybody want to rap, they can holler at Wayne. Wayne going to entertain right. you on that level. Right. My interior costs $25,000, though. That's cost more than some niggas' houses. I'm fly, dog, for real. I'm around the best. Wayne the best that did it. You know I raised him. I really want to open a lane so my youngest could come behind me. If right, you know, right. We got the music thing. That's a pattern of life where we can come about that ghetto. The grounds that made me where I come from uptown. You heard me, Saratoga and Rattle, Malin, Pat, Bryce, Lag, Darryl, Mo, a lot of wrestling in peace. And, you know, the Mel for Me Project, La La Eddie Paul, where I come from on the third floor. Over there with them, you know, rest in peace to a lot of soldiers we left in there. And big ups to the Calio Project, the Magnolia Project, where I come in, where I put my bones down, where I made my bones at. With my brother Shahid, who really second flow gave me all the game I ever needed to survive in this world. And I definitely got to go up further uptown, Valley Street, Coochie Miley. Rest in peace to my little brother, the North Wars on the corner world. You know, everybody who laid their crown down, their brother, you know, for the mounds from where we come from. Um, right. And definitely Big Rufus, Sugar Slim, Squalu, the little homie Jack, Fresh, everybody who held it down for us to get where we got and what we trying to do and what we want to accomplish. Cash Money ain't going to never change. We going to always be neighborhood superstars. We're going to do this to 3,000, Playboy. If money involved, I'm out there. And I can respect it if money involved in a nigga out there. That old foolish shit, that nigga gets some. Let the money talk cause we really need it. Round table while the bosses mean Fast cars, jury, and coliseums. Fuck a hater, my nigga, we don't see him. I got too much money. Too much money. Oh, my baby and Slim, bitches know I'm cash money. Cash money, I'm cash money. Yeah, yeah. Birdman, I'm a motherfucker. We gon' eat, cause I'm a born hustler. Go and get it, we gotta get it. Make the money, nigga, and flip the digits. I put my water on another cape. My little water, he a real gangster. And every summer, we gon' still shine. Cause every day we on a hard grind. hard grind You little niggas ain't ballin' Put some respect on my name Stunner man, been ballin', been shot callin' Make my little dogs into big dogs Uptown, been ballin' money been talk cause we really in Good, Round table while the bosses meet Fast cars, jury, and coliseums Fuck a hater, my nigga, we don't see him. I got too much money, too much money. Oh, oh my money. baby and Slim, bitches know I'm cash money. Yeah, yeah, cash money. big roof up, cash money. let's get it. Yeah, I'm probably shining too hard, flinging too hard, fucking with your bra, driving too fast, land too big, house on the water, I got backyard sand. Yeah, my bitch love me. Yeah, my bitch be singing for me. I already paid the price. Lifestyle so priceless, put the G on ice. Yeah, Quee, tell these clowns we ain't worried about. Birdman, bitch, you heard about. Bitch, the grill platinum plus. The world still riding with us. Don't fuck with us. Gangsta. Let the money talk, cause we really in. Round table, all the 
round table while the boss is me. Oh, yeah. Fast cars, jury, and coliseums. Oh, yeah. Fuck a hater, my nigga, we don't see him. I got too much money. Too much money. Too much oh, money. baby, it's slim. Bitches know I'm cash money. Thank you.